Greetings. I'm Pastor Mike Hubbard. I'll be substituting for Pastor Murray during the month of July as he is on uh, the last month of his sabbatical, getting the month off to a great start, today being the third and tomorrow being the fourth. Please be safe in all you do tomorrow. We have other things happening this week. Uh, there will be a, a memorial service for Janet Brown here at the church on Saturday the 9th at 11 o'clock. Then on the 12th, the afternoon, we'll have our Jazz Vesper service. Certainly looking forward to that and thankful that we've been able to, to resume that. And last but not least, I got to announce the food of the month. Um, now that the tuna has all been taken to the food bank, it's time to, to bring in jam and jelly. And uh, there's a cart will be out front drop by during the week and, and bring something to, to put sweet on the tongue and a smile on a child's face. There's many ways to measure a nation. It's military strength, it's, it's economy, um, it's happiness index, it's, uh, what the, how the stock market, market's performing. But just about any people in the world, any group of people, have proverbs, wisdom literature, Ben Franklin, Will Rogers. Those are our guys. There's some nameless folks. This morning we'll be looking at, at one of those old German proverbs, don't toss a baby out with the bathwater. Wisdom's a precious commodity. I hope we can learn more about it this morning as we worship together. Amen.
Please join me in the call to worship. When we were low, God raised us up. When we were weak, God made us strong. When we were weeping, God brought us joy. Old Testament lesson this morning is found in 2 Kings chapter 5 verses 1 through 14. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man in a high favor with his master because by him the Lord had given him given victory to Aram. The man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from leprosy. Now the Armenians, on one of their raids, had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went and told his lord just what the girl from the land of Israel had said. And the king of Iran said, Go then, and I will send along a letter to the king of Israel. He went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of garments. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you my servant Naaman, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to give death or life that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Just look and see how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the, to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariots and halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go wash in the river Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became angry and went away, saying, I thought that he would surely come out 
and stand and call on the name of his God and would wave his hand over the spot and cure the leprosy. Leprosy are not Obama and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel. Could I not wash it, them and be clean? He turned and went away in a rage. But his servant approached him and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when all he said to you was wash and be clean? So he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. Our gospel lesson is found in Luke, chapter 10, verses 1 through 11, then 16 through 20. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter first, say, Peace to this house. And if anyone there is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person, and if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the labor deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you, cure the sick who are there, and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into its street and say, Even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off in protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me, and whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name even the demons submit to us. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. 
See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, giver of all things good, we open your word this morning and wait on the Holy Spirit to teach us the truth that it holds for us. Give us ears to hear in Christ's name. Amen. So good old Wikipedia, that beloved but questionable source of flexible facts, has this to say about the bit of folk wisdom from which today's sermon title is derived. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater is an idiomatic expression for an avoidable error in which something good is eliminated when trying to get rid of something bad. Or in other words, rejecting the favorable along with the unfavorable. What we think of as a modern corollary, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, was actually set forth in the 18th century by Voltaire, who was actually quoting an earlier Italian proverb. An Eastern take on this idea is even older. It comes to us from Confucius. Better a diamond with a flaw than a pebble without. Other applications include the late economist George, George Stigler's assertion that if you, if you never missed a plane, you're spending too much time in airports. And tell, Terry Goitz, strive for progress, not perfection. Clearly, there is a wealth of wisdom literature, ancient, modern, and in between, suggesting that the pursuit of perfection at the expense of all else is often unwise. This approach sounds a cautionary note against extremism. Moderation is usually the best course. We see from even these few examples that the truth expressed in this old German proverb has been kicked around by philosophers for several thousand years. There are plenty of variations to it, but few examples of what it actually means. However, if there was ever one straightforward, easy-to-understand example in which something good is eliminated when trying to get rid of something bad, today's Old Testament lesson, the story of Naaman, is it. Incidentally, this story did, and probably still does, push the buttons of our Hebrew brothers and sisters. Remember the scene earlier in Luke at the synagogue in Nazareth, Jesus' hometown? He had announced his message and ministry, and during the ensuing discussion, he brought up this very story. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman, the Syrian. And recall how the crowd, who up to this point were mildly skeptical about Jesus, the hometown boy. Now they were filled with rage and tried to kill him because he told this story. There's a lot not to like about it, especially if you're Jewish. Starting with the fact that the person who pointed Naaman toward Elisha was a young girl, an Israeli girl, taken captive by the Arameans on one of their raids. This passage offers a preacher a lot of material. And a lot of that material is about the abundance of God's grace. In this case, that would be the kind of grace lavished on a general who was a hero in his own land because of his military exploits. And some of those exploits were carried out against the Israelite people in whose land he found healing. Let's be honest. 
We don't like that kind of story. God's grace is for people who look like us, talk like us, believe like us, and yes, vote like us. Really, what do you suppose would happen if you were to sit down with a bunch of Ukrainian war refugees and tell them a story about God's healing of a Russian general? Probably not the best idea. But anyway, this stuff's for another sermon. Today is about Naaman's baby and bathwater moment. Naaman was an important man. Naaman's king sent him to Elisha's king. Cut to the chase. Go right to the top. But in doing so, Naaman suffered a bit of humiliation when the Israelite king sent him to a lowly prophet. To make matters worse, the prophet refused to see him, sending out a messenger instead. Naaman wanted a mighty wizard and got Mickey Mouse, a sorcerer's apprentice. He pictured a night on Bald Mountain, complete with special effects, found himself in his entourage in a prophet's dusty driveway. No abracadabra, no shazam, no thunder and lightning. Instead, he was told to take a bath. Not just one, but seven, all in a foreign river that he thought far inferior to Haram's mighty Abana and Parfar rivers. Naaman was very, very close to throwing the baby himself out with the bathwater. If not for the wisdom and courage of one of his servants, he would have. Instead, after a lot of sniveling and complaining, Naaman did what he was told to do, and he was healed. Incidentally, about that grace I mentioned earlier, after Naaman was healed, he became a believer in the one true God. A New Testament fellow we know only as the rich young ruler wasn't as fortunate. Like Naaman, he had a problem, and he went to a man of God seeking a solution. Now, he really was a good guy from his childhood, an observant Jew. Still, there was something about Jesus that stirred a longing, a notion that there was something missing in his life. Like Naaman, he probably had some expectations as to what insight Jesus would tell him, would offer him. And just like Naaman, just like Elisha, Jesus gave him an answer counter to his expectations. Have an estate sale, Jesus told him. Get rid of your stuff. It's holding you back spiritually. He couldn't do it. His stuff, his, his possessions meant too much to him. So he threw the baby out with the bathwater. Today's gospel lesson has its own baby and bathwater aspects. First, there's the ministry, ministry model that Jesus used. The whole two-by-two, two, village by village, go barefoot, take no money. It makes us uncomfortable. We wonder if God maybe expects us to do the same thing. And then there's a part about, I'm sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. That sounds like the score is going to end wolves 70, lambs 0. On one hand, it's just so first century. But on the other hand, we can't help but think about those young yeah, Latter-day Saints missionaries and the service they rendered to so many of the not-for-profit endeavors in our valley. We used to volunteer here at the food bank. We enjoyed having them around. But wait, the story gets worse. Jesus says, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Why, you may be asking, did Luke have to go and write that? Why did the editors of the Revised Common Lectionary include them in today's lesson? And why in the world is Pastor Mike bringing up the whole snake and scorpion thing? Jesus could have talked all day without saying that. 
Young LDS kids going out two by two and helping in food banks is one thing. Bad rockabilly music and snake handling is something else. We'd probably be safe throwing out this particular tub of water. It's doubtful there's anything of importance there with all that snake handling. But of course, there is. As spectacular as all the treading on snakes and scorpions sounds, as exciting as it was for the 70, that even the demons submit to us, Jesus tells them, don't get carried away. Don't get all excited about snake handling and exorcisms. Instead, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. That's the baby in the bathwater. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Because you see, that thief on the cross, the one whose name was written in a Roman executioner's logbook, well, his name is also written in heaven. And so is yours. Even if you never handled a snake, played with a scorpion, or cast out a demon. But you probably have tossed out a baby or two. Because that's what a lot of people are doing these days. In the past, it was mostly the church that practiced dumping babies with bathwater. Some called it shunning, some denominations excommunication, others expelling. We've all heard the saying, the only army that shoots its wounded is the Christian army. Sadly, that's been the experience for far too many of us. For years, Yvonne and I were members of a fairly rigid holiness church. It didn't take much to find yourself on the outside. Tobacco use, any amount of alcohol consumption, playing cards, visiting a casino, attending a movie. A person's spiritual maturity, commitment, and loyalty didn't really matter. The rules were the rules. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. God didn't go to no moving picture shows, and he'd send you straight to hell if you did. And ours wasn't the only denomination with notions of Christian perfectionism. Today, a significant slice of our society has discovered a new kind of perfection. Might call it secular holiness. What has been called cultural or social perfection is widely recognized. You don't believe me? Well, Google it and see what Wikipedia says. It's widely recognized, but not for the improvements it's brought to our world. Social perfectionism leads to anxiety. It leads to avoiding, shunning that which is imperfect. It means shunning, or its current vernacular, canceling anyone who doesn't fit our perception of perfect ideology, correct theology, of our notion of perfect values, our rigid politics, it means tossing the baby out with the bathwater because it's not our perception of perfection. There's absolutely no reason to spend any more time talking about the divisiveness rampant in our land. Because, you know, we've heard it all before. Social media's role in this, how politics has led to a divided land, divided churches, divided families— it's counterproductive to devote any more time discussing the problem. In last week's epistle, Paul said, If however you bite and devour one another, take care that you do not, are not consumed by one another. Well, we're doing that, folks. But we don't have to keep doing it. So what do we do? Really, how do we enjoy the good in a world that demands a black or white, either or, pursuit of perfection. Or in its place, nothing at all. Well, the obvious place to start is by checking the tub. 
Make sure we aren't dumping something good when we toss out the bad. Learn to settle for gray instead of demanding pure, 100% undiluted white. Or instead of black, blacker than midnight in a coal mine, maybe settle for one of those shades of gray. Barack Obama, a guy I feel pretty safe quoting, has this to say. People who do really good stuff have flaws. People who you are fighting may love their kids and, you know, share certain things with you. Some wisdom there. Another guy you hear quoted pretty often around here put it this way. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own? If I might be so bold as to add to the words of our Lord, why are you so worked up about what your neighbor's looking at in the first place? Get the log out of your own eye, and you'll see that the earth is the Lord's and all that dwells within. This morning, we rolled out of bed and faced a woefully imperfect world. That didn't stop us from getting up. The air quality index didn't score a pristine zero, but we wisely decided not to hold our breath until it did. I don't know how far you traveled to get here, but I would guess you passed at least one American flag on your way. If you didn't notice it, Perhaps you can take a second look on your way home. Another thing you might have missed seeing were the armored troop carriers patrolling our streets. You didn't see those because they aren't there. Neither were the police checkpoints. Now that we're here, we're singing songs that our musicians chose from our hymnal, not a state-authorized list. I picked today's lessons from the Revised Common Lectionary. That was my choice. I could have preached about anything I wanted. Your baptisms, memberships, and ordinations are recorded in the register of First Presbyterian Church Medford, not in the state capitol, not in the NSA's database. Do any of these things, our flag, our government, our church, our families, rate a perfect 100% in that all-important perception of perfection? Not even close. But I don't think any of you are going to throw out your gratitude, your thankfulness, and your joy, along with the bathwater. Ancient Israel worked hard at their religion, They wanted to get it right. They wanted to perfect their faith. So would they come before God with burnt offerings, calves a year old, with sacrifices of thousands of rams, offering 10,000 rivers of oil? Would offering their firstborn child be enough? Would that be the perfect sacrifice? Not even close. He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? That may not be perfection, but it is what the Lord requires. It is what is good. Amen.
Please pray with me. Loving God, we come before you as often confused and anxious children. We know who holds the future. We know you hold our hand. And yet, Lord, we look at the world around us and we find it a frightening place, an unfamiliar place. And yet you are sufficient. Not just sufficient for our needs in this world, but sufficient to to a point of abundance that you have given us. Long before we were created, wisdom was brought forth. She was your partner in creating. You have given that wisdom to us. She cries in the streets for us to listen. There are many ways that we can judge our country, our land, the soundness of our economy, our military might, our pursuit of happiness. Or, Lord, we can look at the collective wisdom that we share as a people. Open our hearts to doing so. That we would, we would hear what wisdom cries in the marketplace and by the gates. And that we would, we would know that the kingdom of heaven is where we find that wisdom. And we thank you for it. We thank you for our country. Imperfect though it may be, Lord, we we are here. You have provided abundantly above every need we have. You have given us a measure of safety and security that, that when your son walked this earth, no one would have known. We thank you for that. We thank you for the sacrifice, for the service on the part of of people who came before us and the people who walk with us now, who apply sound wisdom and judgment to make this a, a place that where all are welcome. We ask, Lord, that we would welcome all in your name here this morning in this place that is your your creation your beloved children we would bring even the smallest thing before you because we know it matters we think of the people that are ill or having difficulties we think of Phyllis Skinner, who is now under hospice care and living in the health center. We think about Lonnie Hagler and her daughter Claire facing a difficult week this week. We pray for the friends and family of Joanne Leonard on her passing. For the family of Ann Lowe's sister Emily on the death of her husband Michael. Becky Jones's friend Jean, suffering from a serious infection. Kathy DeWolf's friend Helen, who suffered severe nerve damage from a dental procedure. For Anne's sister-in-law, Breva, upon the death of her father. For Sue Silfast's friend Cheryl, diagnosed now a fourth time with cancer. Only has a short time to live. We thank you for a good report from Harold Sudmeyer's oncologist that Janine Foucault's daughter, Angela, is healing 
and her foot is getting better. Soon she'll be able to get around. We pray these things, bringing them to you as your children, as your disciples, as we seek to learn from you. And as your disciples, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is a time when we reflect on what God has given to us and and what moved by the Spirit we feel compelled to give back to God. Our website has a offering link. You can click there and and uh, make your tithes and offerings. Um, you can mail them to the church. And those are, are good things. But what does the Lord require of you? What can we give toward justice? What can we give of ourselves toward love and kindness? What can we give in humility as we walk with our Lord? This week we'll have ample opportunity to follow in the prophet's words. To love kindness, practice judgment, and walk humbly with our God. This would be a good week. It's a week we celebrate the birth of the nation we live in. It's a time to reflect on the cost of that and not just the fun we can have because we live in a free country. It's a time to reflect on the good, the honorable, the hopeful, and do so in the name of our Lord. Amen. Thank you.